Hello, this is Haka Devine, and today we are going to be reading Those You Leave Behind. A long as heck story that's going to take probably a few videos or just a very, very long video. I was, I was about to scroll through this, I saw how tiny the scroll bar was in the on the right, and I was like, oh dear, this is going to be at least an hour long, which is fun. If you like this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. This is going to be one big, beefy video that you might not survive, and you might fall asleep during, which is wonderful. Now let's get right into this. Part 1. His mother often said his father was York, but she kept so drug but she was kept so drugged by the high priestess that she rarely knew who her callers were. At other times she said his father was a blind fisherman with bad breath, which had apparently stuck in her mind. So Ron didn't take much heed of her words, except to eat sweet smelling herbs when he could. Still, there were others who thought he had more than a ton of the Saint of Thieves in him. Even as a young child, he was constantly scheming to get things that didn't belong to him. He could sweet talk to temple cooks and to give him extra scraps, or little treats he usually save for, for the high priestess and their special guests. The other boys and girls would often find, and non binary kids would often find it come worse, off worse on little deals or bets he'd set up. I'm not sure why they take them in the first place. Once he'd been caught uh, lighting the, a pocket of a high guard while he was enjoying the company of his mother. Priestess Gilead forcefully made the point that men expected the belongings to be safe inside the temple and paid well for that privilege. However, he knows how she emphasized the word inside and simply moved his operations elsewhere. Most of what he got he earned through begging. Are you my father? He asked each man who came in. He'd do his best to ape them, to screw up his feet, features to look a little more like they did, puffing his cheeks out if they were fat, or sucking them out if they were skinny. Sometimes he got a cup behind the ear, but sometimes he'd get a pat on the head and a few coins. Temple children were almost never claimed, but the men who visited could be kind enough in their own way. However, he was growing older now. The cuffs were more frequent, the coins fewer. He would have to leave soon. Temple girls were expected to become priests themselves, but the boys could only say as eunuchs. Ron was starting to think that this was as less of a great deal than he thought when he was younger. So he was considering his career prospects when the old man passed by the front of the temple. Ron was not yet a very good pickpocket. Still, most could find himself to rolling the occasional drunk. But he could see a full, heavy purse hanging from the man's side. And what sort of York orc would he be if he could resist that? He pulled out a little knife he'd sold from the kitchens and hid against his wrist as he approached, trying to look as if, as though he were traveling somewhere in, a, in quite a hurry. Before colliding in the old man. His knife flashed out as he bumped into the old man, intending to cut over the uh, uh, purse to take the man's money. However, the old man's hand shot out and grabbed his bony wrist, twisting until the knife fell from his hand. Ron immediately began struggling to get away, but he couldn't escape the man's grasp. And even as he tried, he saw a large muscled man whom he had noticed is following at a discreet distance. Do you know who I am, boy? The old man said. His hair was white, his eyes yellow, and his teeth nearly as stark as his skin. No, no, please, just let me go. I'll never do it again, Ron promised. I am Lord Tok. Touch the uh, tyrant secretary, you little thief. He said. He slapped the side of Ron's head and pushed him into the arms of the waiting men. Teach him not to steal from his betters, he said. Ron ducked his head as his blows came. It was weeks before Ron Un was recovered. He didn't even remember crawling back into the temple. Priestess had to tend to him, and while she wasn't busy with other duties, luckily the man had done any real damage. No broken bones. 
His wits didn't seem to have been addled. Once the swelling went down, his face looked the same as it ever had. All in all, he'd gotten quite lucky, and he promised himself he'd never be so clumsy again. When the last of the marks faded, he sat out on Temple Steps and once again considered his prospects. Thieving was still a viable option, he supposed, but perhaps not pickpocketing. Not until he learned to be more clever at it. Yeah, perhaps he could find an older thief in need of an apprentice. Boy, move! said a familiar face. Ron looked up and froze. Well? Out of my- the retirement secretary said. Out of my way! I'm a busy man! Roy Owen scuttled over to his side, and a man passed, oblivious to whom he'd spoken. Obviously, I'm going to act like he's a huge jerkwad. <sighs> he didn't even recognize me, Ron whispered. He stared incredulously at Todd's back. He didn't even recognize me! Suddenly he was filled with anger. After all that had happened, the man didn't even know him. Suddenly he felt the need to be on his feet. He ran down the steps, taking him two at a, at a time, right past the man's guards who didn't give him any more of a, of a look than their master. Ayo? Hey, really? Hmm. We're fine for now. <sighs> Who does he think he is? Run fumed. How dare they ignore him? Like he was nothing. He felt like grabbing the nearest person and shouting his name in their faces. But that still wouldn't teach the secretary a lesson. No. He had to think bigger than that. He began to plot and to think, and then smiled grimly to himself. It would take a few days to get these supplies, but he'd manage it. Yes, they knew who he was next time. Yes, he'd make sure of that. They'd shout his name from the uh, towers. Oh, yes. <sighs> Several days later, Run was prepared. Second story work, he, he decided, was much more his style. Then pickpocketing. So many people failed to lock the window. It was high if it was high enough. The hardest part was getting the clothes. By one owner of Lord Veer's servant voice at the bathhouse and giving him all the opportunity he'd needed. Now it's time to put his plan into motion. Rowan walked into the mansion with a determined expression and a piece of paper in his hand. He caught at a glimpse of the servants but was otherwise ignored, including made his way up to the steps toward the Lord's office. On his way up, a door opened and a bearded man. And glared at him. Boy, where are you going? He asked. Uh, up to Lord Artach's office, sir. Rodin replied, beginning the speech he, he referred. I have a missive from... Take this, the man said, stuffing a small satchel into his hand. Well, get going. Yes, sir. Rodin said, quickly a turning away. He continued up the stairs. The office was empty when he, opened, when he carefully opened the door. He breathed this quick sigh of relief. That should make the rest of it easy. He paused to open the satchel, found full of papers. He couldn't read, so ignored them. But he'd likely be able to sell them later. He'll need to be able to write one thing today. She opened the window. He saw the tyrant's balcony across the way. The entire balcony was lined with bars, keeping thieves out, but letting the tyrant look out across the city. It was about 20 feet from the Tatcha's tap. Hour to the tyrants. Too far for Run to drop, um, however, not too far for him to throw. He tossed a hook he'd sold from the fishing boats. It was made for hunting the uh, leviathan eels in the deeper waters. Listen, that's an SCP sort of thing. It was already too heavy for him to throw so far, but he managed it on the second try. He set his foot in the loop he'd made and swung out into space. He nearly let go when he slammed into the wall, but he managed to keep his, his grip. Then he began wriggling up the a rope until he reached the virus. He slipped through, and a dull alt could uh, never made it. Even a boy with a slightly heftier build would have had trouble, but Run was just skinny enough to make it. The room was un uh, ornately decorated. There was filigree artwork, statues of marble and jade, and tapestries. 
He was looking for something impressive to steal when he heard a splashing. Several women in various states of undress were swimming in a shallow pool. He froze, but none of them seemed to see him. They were all clinging to a floating green in tube. They seemed frightened, and their eyes seemed to focus far beyond the walls. He decided they must be drugged with something and made his way around until he came to the tyrant's bed. There he found what he was looking for. It was an artifact of the old world. One of the strange jeweled rectangles they sometimes found in and fly containers with the gold lines running along its green surface. It was the largest he'd ever seen, in nearly as wide as the lengths of his forearms. It must have cost the tyrant dearly to buy. He placed the deck elegantly into his bag. Wait. Oh, it's a green jewel. I was a bit worried that we were going to see mention of a certain character that has been pretty much deleted from this site. Then he took out the jar of paint. He cracked the seal and then used a bit of the tyrant's own bedsheet on the wall behind the bed. He'd had to pay a scribe to know what to do, and he copied the scratches on the paper slavishly. He had to get it just right. When he was satisfied with his work, he went back to the balcony. He slipped through the bars and threw the hook over to Trotter's office. He swung back across and then clambered up to the window. He glanced inside. I had to make sure no one was inside, then made his way back down. This time, no one challenged him. He walked through the street and th with his narrow back straight, his chin and high as any lordling's son. By the next evening, everyone in the city would know his name. He woke up the next morning when he was uh, shaken by Priestess Galia. Wake up! Wake up, you little idiot! Huh? Was? He murmured. There are men all over the city looking for you. You have to get dressed immediately. The silver or haired priestess hauled him to his feet and shoved him in the direction of the hamper where he kept his belongings. No, not that. Something with a hood. You can't be that daft and be in all, all this trouble. As he literally got dressed, he worried saying again, looking for him. But these of the previous day began to come back to him. He'd stolen from the tyrant himself. Not that I think you did it, Gilia said. Not even you would be stupid it enough to paint My name is Roan after selling the tyrant's favorite treasure. But they'll... Oh, oh no, Roan, please. Please tell me you didn't. Um, Roan began to consider whether or not it had been so quite so clever as it had seemed when he'd come up with the plan. Oh, good lord. We have to get you out of the city right now. She bound him up, pulling the hood down over his face. I know, Caravina. He's not leaving until two days from now, but if you get out now, you can move on the road. But now, oh, you, we have to get you out of the sea before someone mentions you to the guard. Now, move! Ron let himself be guided out of the room and out of the temple, pausing only to pick up his bag. Gilead led him down narrow alleyways and through busy markets. Eyes fall from before the guard. Once the guardsman had walked up right up to them, but he was just asking if Gilead was going to be at the temple later. Money changed hands, and she promised she would be for him. When they reached the gate, Gilly put a hand on his shoulder. And you must listen to me. Walk alongside the road for the rest of the day. That should be far away from are enough from the city. Hide there and wait for a caravan to uh, pass. Ask for Tenzin. Tell him that Gilly has sent you. He will help you. Rome nodded. Thank you, Priestess, he said. Then considered the guards. There were four, two watching the inside, two watching the outside. Gilly followed his, his gaze. You'll need to get past him. I can't help you. Priestesses are not allowed out of this out of the city, and they'll be suspicious by approach. Just tell them a different name and pretend and you're out to see your uncle or something. You have a clever tongue, boy. Use it. Th thank you, Priestess, he said. He realized suddenly that he wasn't going to be able to come back to in the city. Not for a long time. Maybe not ever. Not ever. I... he didn't know what to say.
<sighs> oh, Roan, she said softly. She gathered him in to her in a hug. Be brave, be clever, and never stop running while you have breath to give. <clears throat> <laughs> okay. Then she released him and she turned away, walking back to the temple. Rowan squared his shoulders and walked up to the guards. What do you want, boy? One asked. He looked suspiciously at the boy, his piggy blue eyes vivid against his dark skin. Sir, he began, about to tell him what Gillian suggested and, and the sign tried something even better. I know where Rowan is! Where? the guard asked, saying straighter. The other three guards also looked on attentively. One part of the re reward, otherwise ain't telling. You'll tell or I'm gonna black your eyes. Now talk, the guard said, leaning close to run. The other three, including the two who were supposed to watching outside, gathered close. All right, all right, Run said, using his eyes so a uh, tear ran down his cheek. I'll talk, just don't hit me. He's planning on escaping the city. He's coming here. What's he look like? The guard asked. No lies now. He's short and has brown hair, and that's him over there, Run said, pointing into a small figure hurrying through the open square. <laughs> the guard shouted and oh, The two from the inner gate ran, ran toward the men Run and pointed out. While the other two looked on, while their attention was focused inward, he stepped past them and ran out the gate. He heard sort of oath behind him, but he knew it would take them a minute to run after him, if they even decided to. He kept to the road for a moment, then cut off, falling into a ditch and traveling out again. Fields of trees stretched out as far as he could see, which seemed an awfully far away. Was it normal to be able to see that far away? There was a noticeable lack of alleys to duck into, or thick crap out to loot lose himself in. There were people on the road and people working the fields, but nowhere he could simply vanish. That could be a problem very shortly. He glanced behind him. There still seemed to be some commotion at the gate, but no one running yet. What are you doing in my field? Someone yelled. Fred froze. It saw a man and in a straw hat running at him. It hadn't occurred to him that people owned fields the way they owned buildings. He figured it all belonged to the tyrant until you were too far away to who care about him. He decided to take the halfway to approach. S Sorry, I got con confused, he said. Man drew up and looked around up and down. Who are you? He asked. Why are you all alone here? When my name's Heather. Couldn't see my uncle. He decided this was as good as time he, I, I mean, as any to break out Gilly's lie. It had been a good one, all things considered. And it was a shame to waste it completely. The man's face broke into sympathy. Your uncle? Whose farm um, does your uncle work at? I know every landowner around here. I hope I'll help you find him. Ron's face froze. How could the man know everyone? He can't and count on this. At uh at uh Lawrence Farm, he said, giving the most common name he could think of. Hmm, lots of Lawrence around here. Where did your parents tell you to go? asked the farmer. East, sir, Ron said, giving the general area the road followed. That doesn't narrow it down much. Can't you think of anything else? The man asked. Not so good at thinking, sir. Rodas began to wonder if he should uh, just make another run for it. Hmm. Well, I can't take you around to every line east of here. The man seemed to struggle with a decision for a moment and, and put a kindly hand on Rodas' shoulder. All right, you need to listen to me carefully, Ever, he said, speaking slowly. You need to go down the road, walk until you get to a big wooden bridge. There's a farm arm after it. Go and talk to Caswin, he'll help you. Do you understand? Down the road to the big wooden bridge, Run repeated. Talk to Caswin. Good lad, the farmer gave him a gentle shove toward the road, and Run was off. 
No one was coming from the gate. They must have decided he wasn't important. He hoped it would be a good long while before they found out how wrong they were. But now the road was open. The sun warm and the world was his. He held his back over his shoulder and whistled as he walked. Part 2 The rain poured down and Rudd shivered in the tree. He had walked about a day's travel when he was chased from the road by a pack of wild dogs, and he'd gotten away from them by swimming in a river. He'd wander or the lost a couple of days before being chased by a giant lizard, which was now weighing below. And he had no idea where the road was anymore. He was wet, he was miserable, and he was pretty sure he was going to die. That was when the shouting began. At first, he thought it was another pack of wild dogs with the howls and yipping, but there were words mixed in. Hard to understand, but he picked up left, right, and closer. Kangaroos jumped through the bushes, followed closely by dogs, and a man with white painted faces and dark red hair. They threw spears as they ran, and a kangaroo leapt left into the lizard before being caught in its massive jaws. It turns to the hunters. <sighs> they scrambled to a stop, but then run, and suddenly formed up. Those still holding spears taking point. The lizard hissed menacingly, but turned again, picked up the kangaroo, and waddled off, not wanting to risk injury from the hunters. Hey, we got a boy in the tree, said one of the white faces. He wore leather breeches and a simple shirt, both in a model gray and black. Others, dressed similarly, looked up. Strange root for a oryuk tree, another said, laughing. Is it ripe? asked one. Go and smell for yourself, said and another. Oi, you in the tree, you coming down? Fang face is gone. Ron gently lowered himself to the ground and nearly fell as his much abused muscles protested. Th thanks, he said. You're from the city, the white face said. I did not like calling him that. You running away? Ron nodded cautiously. The nomads seemed sometimes traded with the city, but it was said they had little to do with the guards when impossible. Well, you'll come with us now. We saved you. You're ours now," said the nomad. Because I don't want. I. It sounds weird. It sounds like like a um derogatory term. What? Ron was caught by surprise as two of them grabbed his arm. You have rules in the city. We have rules here. That's one. Now come. We have a long way to walk tonight. They pushed and pulled him along until they met up with other hunters. His back with its treasures was taken from him and fresh the cut pieces of meat wrapped in leather were thrust into his arms. Hunters chatted and angrily around him, because they gave him a shove or sagging him as he tripped. He wasn't so much dragged as he was caught up in a friendly, talkative stampede. By the time they reached the camp, the rain had stopped and the moon peeked out from above the clouds. There were conical uh, other tents set up all around as several big fires. Orange and blue pictures that decorate each tent, and bells were, string in, were strung from their tops to a jangle in the breeze. Older men, children, and women stared at them. Their clothing were or is more varied than the hunters, with reds and yellows predominant. The older men had painted faces like the hunters. The meat was taken from Rod's arms, and he collapsed to the ground. He'd never walked so much in his life. He was as hot to his eat by the first nomad. I am the last man. It's been decided that you belong to me. My name is Ron McGann, but was given a sharp rap on the head. Your name? Your name is you, or boy, or city brat. Don't talk to me about names. You're a boy, not a man. He dresses to go into the fires. Now sit down, get something to eat, and go to my family's tent. The one with the man standing alone.
<sighs> Ron did as he was told. The food was meat, vegetables, and roots roasted on sticks over the fire and spiced lightly. It was delicious after a day of running. When he entered the tent, he found already a stone crowd with children, dogs, two hunters, and several women, including one who introduced herself as Stray Taker. She fussed over him a moment in a way that reminded him of the priestesses and decided him to sleep on the new blankets with the dogs and the other children. Rhone gathered her that she was the last man's wife. As he laid, laid himself to the blankets, shoving puppy aside, he was already thinking about how much he would about how he would escape. They'd come when he was weak and lost, but Ron had made a fool of the tyrant. There was no way they could stop someone as clever as him. Not for long. The next day, Ron was wake, uh, woken up by Stray Taker or shaking his shoulder. She throws a bucket into his hands and told him he, she needed him to get water. She spoke slowly, as though he were slow or simple. He hurried along, another stared at him. Hey, city boy! Caught out a girl about his age. Where are you going? Getting water, he said, a trifle defensively. Not like it to be called city boy. I'll help, she said. It's this way. I know, he said, though he didn't. Of course, she said, and her smile told him she wasn't fooled. Ron decided immediately that he didn't like her. What's your name? he asked. She stared at him for a moment and burst out laughing. He definitely didn't like her. I don't have a name. Hey, how old do you think I am? Everyone has a name, Ron said, then paused. Don't they? No one gets a name until they're ready to be man or woman, silly. My mother's name is Third Arrow because she shot a bandit with three arrows, and the third one killed him. She spoke as lightly as she might uh, I have talked about wearing a pretty dress or making a nice pie. I see. And last man's earlier words made more sense to him. From her, he learned that most of the children the last man Stray Taker sent weren't their own. Stray Taker had only a single son who died soon after and wasn't able to have any more. So they took in any children who, did, who had no tent to go to anymore. One whose parents had died, or more frequently, had been taken from other tribes. He guess about that, and it seemed that the Nova, Nova tribes often raided each other, taking children for their own to swell their numbers, so that the tribe could be eradicated that way. Though when that happened, it, tra it generally transpired and the truck was split up to take over the new territory. My father was from another tribe, she said. He won't tell me which one, though. We're ghost hunters now. Ron spent a lot of time with the girl all over the next few days as he learned more about the ghost hunters. Not that he liked her, certainly, but she was willing to talk and he needed all the information he could get. For her part, she seemed amused by his ignorance, which annoyed him to no end. When they broke camp after the first, first week, she showed him how to pack up the tent and leather carefully, folding it so it could be carried to the new location. Poles that were still in good shape were carried, while all bad ones were discarded to be replaced when they reached a new camp. Not many other people were willing to spare her more than a glance at Roan, and when someone did speak to him, it was usually the way straight to Acre did. Kindly, but as though he were an idiot. Last man would occasionally look him over to see if he was still in one piece. He waited until they were in the new place before he made his, his escape. He waited until the bustling of setting up was begun, picked up a bucket in which he'd hidden his bag, taken from the back of last man's tent, as though to fetch some water, and began to walk away.
<sighs> he ducked behind the bushes and was soon out of sight. He ran after that, knowing that once they discovered he was missing, they'd follow his tracks. But not too far, he was sure. One boy captive wasn't worth too much. Once he got far right of way, they'd give up. For a full day, he ran, and it was night when he finally stopped, coming to rest in a, uh, in a copse of trees. He was lost, of course, but at least he was free. Then he heard someone shifting nearby. It was last man. He was standing not ten feet away, leaning on a walking stick, a dog beside him. He didn't look angry or upset or even disappointed, simply attentive. Then he raised his stick and the beating began. When he was done, he threw Ron over his broad shoulders and carried him back to camp. Ron tried to escape several more times, but the result was always the same. Last man would catch him, knock him around some, and then bring him back. He was never punished further, nor did anyone say anything about it except the girl. He became more adept at life in the camp, carrying things for the women and older men. He learned to help clean the tents, what the cooks needed, and how to take care of the bows and the women were armed with in case of raids by other tribes, bands, or monsters. His old clothes wore away and were replaced by leather breeches and simple cloth shirts. After that, he was more easily accepted among the ghost hunters. He was no longer called city boy by anyone except the annoying girl. She still nattered away at him, though he needed her to explain things less and less as went on. Still, he f spent time with her, as much out of habit as anything else. He started playing with, l with blunted spears with the other boys, learning to mock fight with them, and to throw the short spears at targets painted on the ground or in, in the trees. He grew taller and broader in his chest, soon he was catching rabbits and lizards around the camp with the older boys. One of the older boys, who he mentally thought of as sharp nose, was generally regarded as the leader. Ron got along well with them, and they started making plans for mischief. They would play a pranks on on the on other boys or the younger hunters. There's go plays they weren't supposed to, and generally find ways to entertain themselves. Ron didn't think so much about escaping or the city or even how he had cheated. The, the Titan. Mostly the Tyrant. <laughs> the Titan, yes, he cheated the Titan. Okay. Oh, wow, that's a bad joke. Anyway, mostly he thought about what they get up to the next day. Or if the hunters would bring back stories of monsters or other tribes. One day, when he had been with the tribe for several years, Ron and the annoying girl snuck out to the nearby waterhole where a Bunyip had made its home. They climbed a tree and watched as the hairy, scaly monster attacked anything that came close to its pond. Suddenly, Ron glanced up and spotted dust in the distance. He squinted and made out men in the distance. Hey, look over there, she said, pointing. The little girl shaded her eyes and frowned. They aren't our hunters. Let's go, Ron said, slipping down from the tree. They ran back to the camp. Ron immediately he walked up to Stray Taker. There are men coming, not ours, he said. You saw this? she asked, frowning. This isn't a joke, I swear. Ron answered, as a girl. The annoying girl nodded. They didn't have white faces, and they didn't have any dogs with them. Straight Taker nodded and then yelled for the other women. Bows were strung, arrows packed into quivers. Ron and the annoying girl were ordered to stay with the tent and protect the other children. Ron knew they were, were being told to stay behind so they wouldn't get away, but he couldn't figure out a way to get away from all the others without being seen, so he waited until a lot of women did their work. Two hours later, the wind returned, laughing and singing songs about war and rains of arrows and stones.
One of the women took Ron by the hands and swung around when he asked what happened, and then kissed him on the cheek. The annoying girl seemed strangely upset by this, though Ron wasn't sure why. Most oblivious is boy ever. She wasn't the one who was kissed on the cheek like a baby. Clever boy! We'll have a feast tonight! It emerged that the women had hidden themselves well before the men got near, and then shot a fleet of arrows into the ground in front of them. They were from the Black Swords tribe, who were usually friendly, so they hadn't been killed outright, but they'd had to give up their weapons and their finer clothes before they'd be and allowed to leave. And there, if there were so any hunters when- and if there- if any are so there when the hunters get back, they'll be mighty sorry, the, a woman said, laughing. When the hunters returned, there was no sign of the raiders. A few of the younger warriors were sad they wouldn't have to have a chance to try their spears against swords, but most readily agreed that the women had done very well, and that run on an annoying girl had saved the tribe from mischief. Even if, last man pointed out, they should have been at the water hole in the first place. That night, Run was as dozing with a belly, with a full belly. He was roughly pulled to his feet and hustled out of the tent before he figured out what was happening. He saw a forward in the, in the dark trying to figure out what was happening when water was thrown into his face. His blurry eyes made out the faces of some of the hunters. Some held about six, some held lengths of rope, and one held a glittering knife. A guy would go shove between his jaws, and he was forced to walk away from the campsite. When they had gone some distance, the gag was removed, and was taken, and he was taken by the arms. The hunter with the knife, later he recognized him as last man, advanced. Hey, he said and tried to back away, but the others held him and pushed him down on the ground. The knife flashed down and cut away at his shirt, then at his pants, and he was left naked into the stars. The hunters permitted him to stand. Ron was put. Oh, the last man and whistled, and the other hunters formed two lines. Ten times, last man said, on your own, two feet to make a man start. Ron was pushed on into the line. As each as he passed each man, he was struck with a stick, lashed with a length of rope. He stumbled but made it to the end. Nine times, last man demanded. Ron stumbled back through and again. Twice he fell to his knees and made a return to the start of the gauntlet, but he finally made it through the tenth and final time. Last man approached and pulled a jar from a patch at his belt. Ten times to make a man. Well... He dipped two fingers into the jar and came out with something white on them, which he spread on Ron's face. When he was done, he shot Ron on his face in a piece of metal. White face, ghost hunter. The others began to shout and clap. They gave him his gray and black clothes and a spear. He was slapped on the back, punched in the arms, and his bruised body complained again, but he went uh, and traded any of those eggs away. He began to go out with the hunters. He was shown how to take care of his spear and how to make a new one. His job now, although, was to run with the dogs and flesh out prey for the older hunters who would ache to kill. He longed to test his spear out, but he was still much too new to be given that chance. He didn't even have a name yet, but that would come in time. Sharp Nose became a hunter not long after, and the two remained friends. But there was now an edge to their friendship, a competition to be to see who could be better, or Hunter, who would earn their name first. You're just as a city boy, Sharpnose said mockingly. 
You'll be what years before you get a name, if ever. You're too thick in the head, Gren said. Unless you earn a head batting boulders, you'll be years before or you do anything clever enough for a name. They got into showing Matt, and ended up laughing at him until the last man broke up their play fighting and told him to find something useful to do. The annoying in girl had less time to spend with them. Straight take her taking her side, and now she was learning to use a bow, among other womanly duties. Hmm. Ron felt a certain sadness with that. He'd grown used to her. She wasn't nearly as annoying as she used to be. Still, they sold moments when they could. A few ends at the campfire, an hour under the moon. He bragged about feats of daring during the hunt, one or two of, of which actually happened. While she told him who was fighting in the camp, who stole whose dinner, and other little inconsequential inconsequentialities he couldn't have cared less about, except that he loved to hear about them from her. One day he returned from the hunt, and she rushed up, and she rushed up and put her arms around him, grinning like a maniac. You'll never guess what has happened. I might, he said, pretending to be offended. I can guess fairly well. I have a name, she said. That's not how the game is played, he protested. Then it sank in. What already? Oh, and I almost died, she added. What? He he said, his head spinning. I don't care about that. And she said, anyway, my name. I care, he said. It's Breaking Stone. She said, ignoring him. Straythaker herself gave it to me. Isn't that nice? But how? I mean, he's sorry, but she was off. Oh, it was a nice little ceremony. She and the other women and paid my belly and my breast and... Oh, Cray, I don't know if I said that right. I'd show you, but well, I don't think you're quite ready for that. If I was to monetize his channel, this video would never go on, on YouTube. <laughs> but this is just a story, and we aren't focusing on that. How did you almost die? She demanded. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. She suffered slightly. There is a monster. It came near the campsite. To a tree where the children were playing with, with the older dogs. No one could see it, though. It was hiding, he asked. No, it was out in the open, but unseen. Not even a shadow. But killed one of the dogs and would have gone after the children if the dog's hands set upon it. They couldn't see it, but they snapped at it, and we could tell where it was. I threw a, a stone pestle at it, and it broke against it. I don't think I heard it seriously, but it left anyway. Hmm. It reminds me of absence of a shark. We'll have to find it. Kill it, Ron said, shaking. She'd been there. The monster could have taken her. Idiot, she said fondly. What do you imagine the stray talker is talking to the last man about right now? Her sewing. If she's anything like you, he grumbled, but took her point. The next day, the last man took all the hunters aside. He repeated the story a knowing breaking stone had told. We must find it. Kill it. How did the dogs know where it was? asked one of the hunters. 
By their noses, I imagine, Last Man said, but they weren't able to do more than annoy it. What do we do then? Fight blindly? asked another. If we must, the old man answered, but we'll try our approach first. When the dogs quarter it, we'll throw a mud at it. With luck, that will reveal it and we'll be able to kill it more easily. Any questions? There were none. The hunters fled into their usual groups and were off. Ron kept with his dogs while the other hunters in this group spread out. They beat their chests and stamped their feet, hoping to draw the monster towards them. Ron felt like a coward but was secretly glad he wasn't one of the ones making the noise. Despite their efforts though, the sun rose and fell without the slightest hint of danger. Ron began to wonder if perhaps the monster had left after all. Perhaps going back back where it came and from to seek it easier prey. They eventually packed uh, acted in, deciding that night was no time to be hunting something that was already too difficult to see. When they returned to camp though, they found it and they weren't the first group to return. There was a somber earth tone among the women, and the hunters looked frustrated and angry. There was a body by the main campsite. Ron gasped. It was Sharp Nose, his friend. We couldn't get with our spears, a hunter was telling the last man. It moved around and the mud was invisible as it touched its body. The boy! He jumped at it and I swear he held it for a moment before it struck him down. The dogs now shouting drove it off before it could do any more or, or then worry either body, but it was too late. The last man stared at the young hunter's body for a moment, then closed the eyes. His name is Iron Hands. We burn a true man and a true hunter tonight. Ron stood to the sides as they built up a pyre, dressed striped nose into fighter clothes, and set them on to the next life. It didn't seem quite real, but there it was. Sharp Nose would never boss him around again. He'd never get into mischief with Roan or wrestle with him over a joke. It wasn't fair. In a moment, the fire was in him again. The same fire that made him steal the tyrant's treasure. It wasn't right that Sharp Nose was killed. It was time to make things right. His mind worked feverishly, and soon he came across a plan. While the others told stories of Sharp Nose, Ron went from one tent to another and began to assemble the items he needed. He realized in a detached way that their owners would probably be cross with him if it didn't work. Possibly even if it did, but that didn't matter because his plan would work. He would make sure of it. He waited until almost dawn and then set out to where Sharp Nose and the others had gone. He didn't know it would be either, but he had to start somewhere. He took out Sharp Nose's bloody shirt and tied it to the dog that had come out with him. He climbed into a tree and threw a stick, which the dog chased and brought back. <sighs> Ron threw another sick and another. They kept this up for the better part out of an hour. The dog rested on an occasion, but after a evil sit down, it was ready to fetch edge sticks again. It didn't know why Ron wanted to do this, but it would add to the pile under the tree as for as long as he threw it up. Suddenly, the dog dropped the latest stick and growled. Ron tensed and in his perch, and he heard the heavy breathing of something very large. He also heard someone else approach from the back, from back the way of camp. The hunters, of course they'd be coming, he had to act quickly. Hey ugly, too ugly to show your face? Hey! You want some meat? There's plenty of this tree. Try picking this fruit, he yelled, shaking the branches. There was a growling as something charged a tree. The dog held its ground until it was kicked aside, casually. It fell, but was on its feet again in a minute, snapping at something but not quite finding it.
<sighs> the tree each shook as something hit it. It was big, far bigger than Ron had realized. The branches were bending aside as whatever it was reached for him. He almost dropped to the other side to run, but remembered Sharp Nose's face on the fire and stilled his heart. He pulled a bundle from his bag and dropped it. It had taken him the better part of the night to make this net. It, it wasn't a very good net at that. It was a regular, with holes of varying sizes and a loose weave. But all that matters was that it would catch on the creature, and that it would keep the belt else from the tents on it. The net vanished as it landed, but he could hear the bells shaking. Now he jumped to the other side and began running towards Hunter. He saw him emerge into the clearing as a crashing sound indicated the uh, monster had left the tree. The bells! He shouted. Throw at the bells! They stared at him like he was mad, and he thought for a moment and that uh, all was lost. And last man stepped forward. He cocked his head, listened as the jangling bells came closer, then threw a spear. It landed, vanished, and there was a roar to tell it hit its mark. The other helders belatedly throw released their own throwing spears and it raised their long spears, advancing on the creature. It tried to escape again, but now it slowed down by the injuries it was already taken, and they could hear exactly what it was. They thrust into it again and again, and it fell to the ground, so they kept stabbing until they were sure it was dead. Then they built a fire around it and burned the body to invisible ashes. So, Hunter, last man said later, you are certainly a man now. You've paid us back for your life. What will you do now? Ron thought for a moment and then said, I am a ghost hunter, but I would also like to see more of the world before I settle down. More of the world? What more is there to see? More monsters, more people. I have been in a city. I have been with this with the tribe. But what about other cities, other tribes? I would like to see if there are other wonders I might find. I remember things I might bring back. Last man whistled. Those are mighty big ambitions. Don't you think you overreach yourself? I have always overreached, Ron said, grinning. That's how I got lo such long arms. Are you sure you'll be coming back? Last man asked. Ron looked to the fire where Breaking Stone and sat laughing with the other women. I'm sure, as often as my feet will bring me. The last man smiled. Come back with treasures. Come back with honor. But mostly, come back with stories. She will appreciate those most of all. I will. Thank you, last man, Ron said. Oh, and city boy, last man said. Y yes, Ron asked hesitantly. No one but sharp nose and the annoying and girl had caught him that in years. Your name, the old hunter intoned slowly, is Beller. And that is the original story for Beller, as I just learned. That was the story, Those You Leave Behind. From the Bellaverse canon. And it was, your or it was the origin story for the character named Beller. Who, if you remember the first story, went off to find some treasure or wonder of the world got caught and uh, slightly modified by I think it was as Dr. Everett Mann also known as the Everman and found a list of uh, sites to go to that were still around in Australia 
If you like this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. It is unknown what I will be doing tomorrow, but until then, goodbye!